Hi, everyone. I'm Manolis. I'm here to talk to you about Seam, our domain-specific language for writing local edits on graphs. First of all, uh, what is a local graph edit, and why do we care about them? Well, let's take a look at a motivating application. Uh, our example comes from the field of physical simulation. Uh, here, I'm showing you a video from a SIGGRAPH 2014 paper where the authors are trying to simulate a paper uh, sheet tearing. Uh, to do this, they set up a mesh composed of connected triangles. And this mesh is used to track stress and other physical values on the various points of the sheet. As you can see in the video, as the simulation progresses, uh, some areas of the sheet develop steep gradients and require an increase in detail to be simulated correctly. Uh, later on, this steepness may drop, so then we can also reduce the detail to reduce the simulation load. Uh, where the tear forms, uh, the mesh needs to change direction to align with it. Uh, this process of changing the mesh dynamically uh, according to the needs of the simulation is a technique called adaptive remeshing. and is necessary for uh, accurately simulating phenomena like paper tearing. Uh, the triangle mesh we saw in the previous video is an example of uh, a structure graph being edited locally. Uh, the adaptive remeshing is performed by repeatedly applying local edits at different points of the mesh. Uh, for example, we might collapse an edge to reduce detail. Uh, we might split an edge to increase detail. Or we might flip the edge to change its direction. What all of these operations have in common is that they can all arbitrarily modify objects and connections, but they can only do so within a bounded number of hops away from their arguments. Other applications can also be viewed as instances of a structured graph being edited locally. Uh, for example, a social network where users are connected by follows, or a task graph in a distributed system where tasks are connected by dependencies. Uh, now I'll note that for some of these applications, the performance of these local edits is an important factor. Uh, for example, in adaptive remeshing, uh, the simulation needs to pause while remeshing is running. Therefore, we'd like our local edits to have as low an overhead as possible. Now that I've shown you what a local graph edit is, I claim that these sorts of operations are hard to get correct, particularly when you also care about performance. And to see why that's the case, uh, let's try and write one of these applications in C++ and see the kinds of issues that come up. Uh, we'll try to implement one of the operations used in uh, uh, adaptive remeshing called edge collapse. And the goal of this operation is to collapse two points on the mesh into one. And this has the effect of reducing the number of triangles around those points. Uh, first of all, we need to define our data structures. So we'll define a struct for each of the objects in the mesh, in this case, triangles and vertices, and we'll connect them up using uh, pointer fields. Then we will implement the operation by deleting one of, the, one of the endpoints, the tail, and then redirecting everything that used to point to the tail to instead point to the head. Um, to do that, we need to have access to those triangles that are touching the tail. Um, and with the information that we have available right now, the only thing we could do was iterate over the entire mesh. But that would introduce a huge slowdown. Uh, so instead, what a, a reasonable thing to do is to define an extra data structure that caches this information. So every vertex now has with it a set of touching triangles. And at this point, if we have this information, uh, we can simply request, we can simply access all the triangles that are touching the, the tail iterate over them, and then for each of them, do the redirection. Find, uh, specifically, we find which one of its uh, vertices was, was the tail and uh, redirect that to point to head. Uh, now note that uh, just having this information uh, is not enough. We also need to keep it in sync. Uh, what happens is within the operation, we're updating the fields as we're running. Um, so this information will be quickly out of sync. So it is the programmer's responsibility to know what kind of uh, incremental updates need to happen. Uh, in this case, adding the new triangles to the head. Now our redirection is complete. Uh, all we have to do is delete the tail. Uh, note that uh, we had to delete the tail after we're done using it. Uh, and that brings up a point about these sorts of codes, that we must be careful about the order in which we perform our operations. Uh, sometimes this is easy to figure out. So here we delete the tail after we're done using it. Uh, other times it's less straightforward, for example, uh, when we're updating elements within a loop, uh, we must be careful to avoid invalidating the iterator while we're still using it. And besides ordering, we also need to care about memory safety. We need to make sure we don't do things like delete the same element twice or leave a dangling pointer uh, to a deleted element. 
Um, for all of these, for all of these issues that I talked about, uh, keeping auxiliary data structures in sync, uh, ordering, and uh, memory safety, it's easy to write code that is almost always correct, uh, except for certain edge cases that are hard to find. Um, even even this tiny program has an edge case, uh, which is if the head is equal to the tail, if we ever run the program on such an input, we will cause both an iterator invalidation and a dangling pointer bug. Um, if we have no formal guarantees about the safety of the program, then we can never be sure that we've covered all edge cases uh, or even that we've considered all possible failure scenarios. So in the rest of the talk, I'll show you how uh, our domain-specific language uh, helps programmers with these issues, uh, helps programmers uh, write these programs more easily, enables formal verification, and all the while getting compiled to low-level code so we can integrate into performance-critical applications. So first of all, we've designed Seam to sidestep a lot of the issues we saw in the C++ example. And I'll demonstrate that by walking you through how we'd write the same application uh, that we wrote before, but now in Seam. Uh, in Seam, data structures are, are uh, represented as relational tables. Uh, for our edge collapse example, we would have a table for vertices and a table for triangles. Uh, and in, in those tables, the rows are elements, the columns are fields, and uh, pointers are replaced by um, row identifiers. And in this example, I'm showing a simple mesh and how it's encoded as tables. Now, in the C++ example, we saw that uh, these base tables are not enough for, uh, for our use case. Uh, we need to define an extra set of data structures to encode the touching triangles that we need to access during the operation. Uh, in, in Seam, we still need to do that, but it's not the programmer's responsibility to build and maintain these data structures. Uh, instead, we borrow the concept of views from relational databases and we allow the user to give a declarative specification of uh, the contents of these data structures. Um, and then it's actually the compiler's responsibility to emit code that both generates and maintains them incrementally. The, uh, the compiler will also make sure to emit indices over these views according to the kinds of access patterns we need to do. Um, in this case, we are in our operation, we need to, t to access the triangles that are touching a vertex. Uh, so an index on column V of our view is appropriate and the, uh, uh, the compiler will make sure to set it up and maintain it. So here's the, here's the seam equivalent of the same code that we saw before uh, in C++. Uh, the, first thing, the first thing you'll note is that uh, the code doesn't, is, isn't actually uh, very different from C++. You know, the, the, the keywords may be different, but what we're doing is still um, deleting elements and iterating over touching triangles and uh, to perform the redirection we're setting a po we're essentially setting a pointer. So one of the features of our language is that uh, programmers can use it as if they're using a familiar imperative language. Uh, then another thing to note is that we don't seem to be worried about the order in which we perform our updates. Uh, we are performing updates within the loop and not worrying about iterator invalidation. And even worse, we're first deleting the tail and then using it. And, and that is totally fine in Seam because of our execution model. Um, all of the updates are not performed immediately. They're instead logged, they're collected in a log, and that log is applied all at once at the end of the, of the execution. Then, as I alluded before, there is, uh, there is no code written by the user to maintain these indices, uh, these views. And also, the compiler takes, uh, comp uh, takes care of uh, building, maintaining, and using the indices. In this case, it will automatically use the index to uh, support fast access to the, to the triangles uh, surrounding the tail. Uh, to evaluate uh, how much more productive Seam uh, lets the programmer be, we wrote a remeshing benchmark in Seam, and we compared it against two existing remeshing libraries. Uh, what we found is that not only is the operation code 10 times uh, shorter, for all, these for all these operations that we wrote, um, the entire application actually runs faster. And what this suggests is if you have to write these things manually, um, not only are you, you, do, you, do you open yourself up to making errors, but all of this complexity leads to inefficient implementations. Um, at this point, we saw that uh, Seam uh, takes care of a lot of these issues automatically, but certain issues still remain. Um, and to tackle those, we actually rely on static verification to avoid any sort of runtime overhead. Um, we'll see how, uh, uh, in this session, a uh, section I'll show you how the scene verifier helps us debug this edge collapse operation that we wrote before. 
uh, first thing that uh, our verifier needs to do is handle the views. Uh, and actually, in, in Seam, the, the views are taken care of by the compiler by emitting uh, correct by construction code. So we don't need to do anything to verify that code. Instead, all we need to do is uh, take the definition of the view and convert that to a uh, logical formula that describes their contents. And then we can simply inline that formula on the code. And then having, this, having, having done this step, our code only talks about the base tables and columns and we can proceed from this point uh, to check a simple memory safety property. In this case, that the code never leaves dangling references. So to do that, the first thing we need to do is to uh, model symbolically what, the, uh, what effect the operation has on memory. And in Seam, it's actually possible to do this exactly. Um, for deletions, it's easy to see that any execution of this operation will ever only delete exactly the tail. But this is still possible to do for updates. And we can do this by setting up a set comprehension that describes that set, that represents that set exactly. So uh, there is two reasons why we can do that. Uh, first of all, in Seam, the, uh, the loop construct is not a general while loop. Instead, it's a map over a table. So all we need to do to represent it is quantify over the contents of that table. And then later, we can combine all the conditions that guard this update and these form a filter on the set comprehension. Now that we've set up our comprehensions that describe our updates, we can simplify them by dropping uh, redundant conditions and then combine them to form a, a, a proof obligation. And then we can feed that to an SMT solver. Uh, the translation to SMT is straightforward. The, uh, the tables are modeled as uninterpreted sorts. The, function, the fields are modeled as uninterpreted functions. And the specific property we're trying to prove uh, defines the shape of the formula. In this case, we're trying to see whether the right-hand side of an update ever aliases a deleted element. We have the formula in this form. We can also expand these set membership queries into subformulas. And once, once we've done that, we can feed it the, form, the whole formula to an SMT solver. And uh, then, depending on what the solver answers, uh, if the solver answers uh, unsatisfiable, then we know this behavior will never come up. Our, our, uh, we're guaranteed that our operation never violates, uh, never uh, presents a dangling reference bug. Um, in this case, as you expect, uh, the solver returns a satisfying assignment, and we can convert that assignment into a counterexample. And the problem, as you saw, was that the head could alias the tail, and that would trigger a bug. One, one possible fix for this is to simply add a, a guard at the top of the operation that uh, guards against this uh, condition. And then this will add some, uh, this will trickle down to our SMT query. And then eventually the operation is proven correct with regards to this bug. Now, besides these uh, basic memory safety uh, questions, users often want to enforce additional validity constraints. So let's, let's take an example from our, uh, from our application. Let's, see, let's say we've been running remeshing, and we've discovered that a lot of our triangles have, um, have degenerated, which means uh, two or more of their vertices have become equal. And let's assume that that's something we want to guard against so we can use uh, Seam's feature of invariance. Um, in, in Seam, we, we can define invariants, and the way we handle them while avoiding runtime overheads is by uh, discharging them completely statically. So the invariants will become axioms for the proof task, meaning that uh, we only need to care about valid inputs. But they also form an extra proof goal that we need to, we need, the verifier needs to prove that an operation, uh, if, given a, if starting from a valid input, maintains all invariants under all executions. So let's, let's see how we'd actually prove our invariant in our edge collapse operation. Um, the main difference from the previous uh, proof uh, task is that now we need to talk about the final state of the data structure, not just the initial state. Uh, in Seam, we can still do that. As we said, um, as we saw before, we can uh, describe the, the, the exact updates that happened during the operation. So then we can use that information to build a function describing the final contents of the data structures of the field symbolically. So in this case, we know that the final value of v0 um, will be the head if, the, if for, for every triangle that passes all the checks, its value gets set to head. Otherwise, it retains its previous value. 
So according to the same uh, idea, we can also describe V1 prime. And then the question becomes, can we ever start from a valid input and reach the state where, two, where there exists at least one triangle with uh, it, two of its vertices equal? And we can just use these definitions we have and plug them in and create a big formula that takes all, edge ca all the cases. And we, if we feed that to an SMT solver, this is the counterexample that comes out. Um, if we simply collapse an edge in an existing triangle, then that causes the triangle to degenerate. Here's a, here's a possible fix for this problem. Uh, essentially, what we need to do is if a triangle will become degenerate, then we delete it instead of uh, performing the redirection. And in the example below, I'm showing the triangles that would need to be deleted, and those are exactly the ones that touch both the head and the tail. Here's a code that does this, does this check. If the triangle we're interested in also touches the head, we delete it. Otherwise, we continue with the redirection. And at this point, the code passes all checks. To wrap up this section, uh, let's take a look at the full list of properties we guarantee. Uh, first, we check uh, basic memory safety. For example, that uh, the code never uh, deletes the same element twice or leaves references to, an, to a deleted element. Uh, we check, as we saw, that in all invariants are maintained under all possible executions. And we also check that given the same input, our operation will always produce the same output. And in particular, that it doesn't matter uh, which, in which order elements are stored or in which order loops iterate over them. In the paper, we also proved that our verifier is sound and uh, sound and precise. Sound is be meaning that any, op any operation that's proven uh, correct indeed has no none of these uh, bad behaviors. And precise meaning that whenever we get a counterexample, that counterexample uh, is guaranteed to exhibit the, the uh, unwanted behavior. Uh, then also, we should note that the formulas we prove we produce are unsatis un undis general undecidable. They're generally undecidable to check. So we have to rely on uh, heuristics by the SMT solver, and there's always the case that those heuristics uh, never, never terminate. So we evaluated our verifier by running it number of, on a number of operations on various schemas, basic graphs, social networks, various kinds of meshes, and all of them verified in under a minute, and actually most of them in milliseconds, uh, with the exception of invariant maintenance on tetrahedral mesh. And the reason for that, as I alluded to before, is that our uh, formulas are undecidable. So we have to rely on um, the SMD solver's heuristics. And even though CVC4's finite model finding heuristic is great for our use case, it, it still has limitations. So to summarize, uh, at the beginning of the talk, I identified some of the challenges in writing local edits uh, by hand. Then I showed you how Seam makes these codes easier to write. And finally, I gave you a taste of how our verifier works and how it can uh, aid us find corner cases during development. And at this point, I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>